Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 65, Seth Storage, and I'm not an expert, but I have some experts here from 45 Drives. How are you guys doing? Pretty good, Tom. Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having us. This is a uh, repeated request. What about Seth? Isn't <laughs> Seth the solution for everything? Doesn't it solve all of my storage and scalable problems? And aren't there big companies using Seth, so even small companies should use it? And I think... Um, both of us and all of us in attendance here, 45 Drives, if you uh, didn't know, they've been made famous by a few YouTubers, maybe Linus uh, and all of us other tech tubers. You know, we we love their storage arrays and things like that. But when they're not doing, you know, stuff that you see on YouTube, you guys actually uh, have a ton of expertise in designing pretty large scale systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's some of the biggest F clusters you've built? Oh, God. <sighs> they're getting up there. Okay, these days. so... There's the one. Oh, geez. Now I got to be careful not to say <laughs> name names. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, 11 petabytes yeah. is the one comes to mind. And then and 14, 14. Yeah. That, that's yeah, the, the, that's the one. one yeah. yeah. The 11 petabyte one. I think they're, they're planning to buy another rack, but actually, uh, yeah, that they, so that that's kind of great for us. Right. Cause it really, um, vindic not vindicates, but like tells us that we, we know what we're doing. Yeah. These guys came in a couple years that's ago the best part. for a massive solution and it's been going, it's been going, but they haven't expanded and they just came back for a pretty big expansion. So we're very, very happy to hear that part. No, but you nailed it. That's our, that's our real KPI, our mark of yeah. success. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they bought it. Great. Yeah. I came back four years later because they wanted more. Okay. Right. Ooh, exactly. We did it. <laughs> right. Right. And, and that's getting, being a consultant, getting called back for more. That's how you know you did it right. Yeah. And, the reason I bring this up is you guys aren't reading from the docs and saying, this is how stuff works. You're saying we built 11 petadite servers and we're going to sell them another 11 petadite rack. So uh, yeah. you guys are definitely like the reason I brought you in, you are the most knowledgeable people. And I have Seth questions. I'm emailing these guys. So this is as we work with them on projects and uh, fun stuff like this. So uh, I guess the first thing we do is get started and say, can you just format your drive as Seth? <laughs> yeah, probably not. We've, yeah. Well, What's I don't, the basis I don't think of it. Seth and <laughs> uh, yeah, so Seth is definitely made to run on top of uh, of operating system, right? So Linux predominantly, um, but really all Seth actually is, is is a collection of services that run together as one, as kind of a coherent unit, right? So you think uh, you hear things like the Ceph monitor. The Ceph monitor maintains consensus of mm -hmm. the cluster of of you know election process and and things like that, and it also holds like the cluster map. You get the manager. The manager hosts your dashboard. It actually does a lot of metric collection things as well. And then one thing that's very different from, from what people will, will normally think of when they think of storage and RAID arrays is they have OSDs. And an OSD is typically What's an, one, OSD? an object storage device or an object storage daemon. And so it's literally just one drive and then a piece of software or a daemon right? That manages that one drive. And so if you have a hundred drives in your cluster, you've got a hundred daemons managing a hundred drives and then they all kind of talk yeah. to each other. The way I like to always kind of conceptualize that is like a big, you got a big, uh, not stored, a big shelving unit of digital cubby holes. <laughs> it's just like every drive is independent of each other yep. and a collection of servers logical to the Ceph cluster. It doesn't, care how many individual servers you have or not it just sees a bunch of storage space mm -hmm. and with the three critical services you mentioned the monitors yep. which are the gatekeepers of everything yep. the managers who keep track of all the metrics and the osds who actually do all the storage parts yeah that's the core of a ceph cluster yeah exactly and so where it's so different from from when you think of standard storage is when a native ceph client is talking to a ceph cluster they're actually literally talking to the osd so they're saying hey i want to write an object and they're talking to that daemon or i want to read an object and they're going right to that daemon and saying give me that give me that object i want to read that rather than having a, a centralized system with like a lookup table and, and and things like that so and you just nailed it there and that's that's kind of the point of ceph ceph we'll get into this whole thing but the original point of ceph was it is the forever expandable living organism the future of storage and all that which which it is it does but it doesn't always have to be that big yeah but what it does differently is if anyone's tried to scale file systems before, particularly distributed across networks, think cluster, think luster, there's all kinds of them. Um, it gets really difficult. It gets really difficult eventually. File systems as we know them, we love file systems, humans do. Right? Yeah, human usable. Makes sense. Yep. Um, they don't scale very well 
as they get massive, like yep. petabyte scale. Um, Metadata starts to really weigh it down. <laughs> yeah. So what Ceph does is it tossed that all out. Sorry, I'll give you a shot there. Uh, it tossed all that out and um, rebuilt it from the ground up. And like, we're going to do everything as objects and it's going to be kind of flat. There's just a bunch of objects in a pool and it uses something called the crush algorithm. Mm -hmm. Controlled replication under scalable hashing. hashing. Yeah, there you I go. nailed it. <laughs> I did not practice that. Um, but really the whole point of that is to generalize it is whenever a client goes, hey, I need a piece of data or something, it doesn't go to a centralized lookup table or whatever. It yep. just using that algorithm knows exactly yeah. where and the OSDs are. But the nice part of that is as Seth reshuffles itself around and like I said, a storage organism yep. heals itself. And you never have to go to a kind of central lookup table to find exactly. where everything is. <laughs> and uh, all that to say that, no, there is no Ceph operating system. I think we <laughs> went off on a tangent, but yeah, um, it's, it's, it's very much a complex, uh, essentially a, a, a series of, of services that, that you the server has to run the Ceph tool that then presents to the Ceph manager for all of it. So you could almost think of like, if you had a series of 45 drive servers, each one of them kind of stands alone. So even though you may have different array setups, you may have ZFS running with, you know, X number of drives, X number of VDEVs, it presents as one more node to uh, apply that storage. And then you kind of design it. If you have two of them, maybe you want redundancy. If you have three or more, can it do like a load balance or a uh, kind of like a RAID array of d physical uh, systems? So that, that is really the beautiful thing about Ceph uh, compared to other clustered solutions is there is no essential master node or something that, that uh, everything flows through. So when you add a new node in your Ceph cluster, you are literally adding, you know, let's say if you have three nodes, you're adding now 25% of that storage is now spanned across four nodes. So when a client or when clients come online, it's not, hey, that client has to go through master node one to get to all these nodes. They client one is is able to use all of the nodes. Client two is able to use all the nodes. So you are literally bringing online big new chunks of storage into the cluster. Exactly. But, and then there's almost two layers of that right there. So what you're saying is as far as Seth's concerned, it's back to that kind of digital cubbyhole thing I said. Mm -hmm. It just sees massive amount of storage. But then like Tom's question, people are like, okay, well, can I make it look like a RAID array or replicate it? Because mm -hmm. it's just like, we've got to have some redundancy here. Of course. And then so what, what, what happens there is everything you just said, and they connect the OSDs directly or whatever, but then data is actually organized into the concept of storage pools. Yep. And the storage pools, each individual logical storage pool has its own um, uh, failure domain. Failure, failure domain, domain rules, crush rules, but, I guess, but, right? But rules, how it disperses the data. And there's two ways to store data in Seth. Yep. You can replicate it. Yep. Replicate it is easy. It's just n times the number of copies you want or erasure code yep. and erasure code breaks it. Well, erasure code is, you can essentially think of it as raid. Little raid for servers, essentially. Yeah. yeah but it's it, a nice, but, easy way to do it. But you're not raiding the blocks on the storage device. You're raiding the, the, the chunks of the file yep. and dispersing those around. So yep. if I had a four plus two erasure code, it's essentially a raid six, right? Yep. I have a, a, an object file that comes in. I get, cut into four pieces yep. and then I generate two parity bits exactly. and I disperse them around the cluster exactly. in the way that I say, keep it all safe. And that, the really cool thing about that then is, is so you don't have a cluster that's let's say a RAID 6 cluster. You can have, you can do it at the pool level and have very, very different rules for different types of data. So you've got a six node, a five node, a four node cluster, you know, your, your pool that um, is your SSD high performance tier pool. You could have that as a three replica. So every object gets replicated three times uh, throughout the, the cluster. And not only does it stop there, you can also say, well, I want my failure domain at the host level or I want it at the rack level. So if you- and That's the key. Yeah, because you can scale that, right? So let's say your, your, your cluster spans multiple racks. Well, you can say no more than one copy is going to be per rack. So you can lose an entire rack of storage without the cluster really caring all that much it just keeps going on it still has uh, at least you know its minimum amount of copies to continue and it keeps reading and writing so the flexibility is is almost infinite i guess you could say yeah and you nailed it because practically like um if i'm going to put a bunch of hard drives and ssds in this thing i want to keep them separate i don't want to necessarily do yeah. the same type of storage array or maybe i want to yep. do a large erasure code on my spinning disks and, yep. and my vms are going to serve sorry my vms my ssds are going to serve, serve your VM vms store well um 
uh, replication will give me read latency better than it will write. Exactly. So, and so then you can kind of break things up logically on that. Yep. And that's the point of it too is is not only when you're when you're kind of deciding is it a race recording, is it replication? Yes, the efficiency is going to change by that, but there's also definite better workloads that are suited to different types of profiles. So erasure coding is fantastic for object storage, right? Or workloads that are very uh, write once, read many, those type of uh, workloads, fantastic for EC. So there's lots of considerations when doing it, but yeah, you, you've got a lot of flexibility in how that all kind of comes together. I, I think it's interesting too, because if I understand this correctly, that means you can have a larger stuff cluster, but by policy, land the data in the part you want. So you have one yeah. large, I guess we would refer to as a namespace for yep. all of your stuff, but then I need these VMs need high performance. These ones don't. So by policy, these are replicated onto my faster storage devices. This policy sets that this object talks over here. And of course, being able to migrate those objects between there because, well, we decided we want these over here. And then you can probably do like a migration and the magic just kind of happens in the back end. Exactly. A really, really cool thing about all that too is how seamless it is. So let's say you build a pool and you build a pool on spinners up front, right? <clears throat> you set that and you start to find out, damn, this, this really isn't performing as well as I expected. And so you want to move that off to your flash uh, storage. You can keep that workload going as normal so you can keep everything running and then in the background go and edit your crush map and say okay i want to move that rule to my ssds in the background ceph will start slowly or as fast as you want really start moving the objects over to the flash tier while you're still using it while the workload is still up and running and it all kind of just happens seamlessly in the background until eventually every single object has now moved over to flash where you see that big benefit then uh, come up. So that's, that's one of the things that I love. I've actually just did it recently for a customer. Yeah. And so back to your point, it's not so much that you move the objects from one pool to the other. You just tell the pool to go live somewhere else or you change its policy. So like once, once a storage pool is kind of created with its objects in it, the way Ceph kind of builds its applications on top, whether, cause we didn't touch this yet, but Ceph can offer S3 block or file system access. Once you've kind of designated one of those to a purpose, it that's what it's for. I yep. can't take yeah, file system objects and go put it in S3 pool underneath Ceph. Without and replicating. It, yeah, yeah, at that point, you kind of have to go back out through the client tools because you're speaking different languages at that point. But if what Mitch said, okay, mm -hmm. this pool is underperforming, i got to get this on the SSDs. Mm -hmm. We just say, hey, you, storage? <laughs> Change your device class. SSDs. Yep. Or... Um, we, you know what? You're too expensive. I can't afford you right now. I don't need four copies. I'm ratcheting you down yep. to three. Bring you down to three. Like so up. you don't so much move objects from pool to pool. You just kind of tell pools to go somewhere Change else. Change the rules. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that's the next point to, we should get to is how the clients actually interact with it. There's almost like an intermediary because it's how you're presenting the storage. Does the system speak native Ceph that you're connecting so it can talk in the Ceph language? Or usually, especially if you're connecting, let's say, a bunch of Windows users, that's, they just see a share. It's yep. it's Samba being presented. So you actually have to do it behind Samba, not at the Windows level, so to speak. Yeah, that's actually a great point. We we touch on this a lot in the in the CEF training that we uh, put together recently. We have a two day CEF course, and so the first of it, it really starts with talking about traditional storage versus CEF, and where we draw that line is. Ceph has these native tools. So if you're using Ceph's file system, CephFS, if you've got a Linux environment, you can. Um, and so that's what we call a native, or if we're using Ceph block devices, uh, RBDs, they can also be used natively. Actually in Windows as well, there's some really cool drivers to let you use those RBDs natively. And then just like you're talking about Tom there, like then there's the essentially non-native Ceph client where you wanna re-export Ceph in a way that's easier to access for you know ubiquitous protocols like SMB, NFS, yeah, or, or they, iSCSI. They wanna use Windows ACLs. They want or to Windows ACL, you that's got the thing it. With yep. the, 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 the open source, slash Linux Unix world is like, how do I look like the what's already in place? Already in place I don't exactly. want to reinvent everything yet. Yep. So like even knocking that back, um, how do the clients connect? Mm -hmm. Well, Ceph can present itself as files, yep. block, or objects. Object. So when we say objects in this case, I'm putting quotes around it because we're, it presents itself through the S3 protocol, mm -hmm. which was authored by Amazon. Yep. Um, 
when they implemented it. But there is another way to do it. You can speak Rados, Rados yeah. which is, and again, why I put the quotes <laughs> in, because there's two object axes. It's like native Ceph Rados objects or S3 objects. Yeah. Most people use Ceph and speak S3 to it when they're speaking object. Yep. But a lot of kind of developers or people who build applications build that apps. natively use yep. Ceph will speak to the, the Rados, the lib Rados layer, and yep. they'll make I don't know, Python, C++, Py exactly. there's, there's yep. C++ Lots of Python, Python, Java. There's all kinds of bindings to get in there and speak mm -hmm. right to that. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, Samba, we do a lot of, uh, how would we connect to Samba uh, Certain, like how would we present some or SMB shares to clients? Mm -hmm. Well, we'd use gateways, we'd mount CephFS, we'd have Samba then re-export that share out. Yep. And then we use CTDB. If anyone's familiar with CTDB, it's the kind of clustered trivial database. It's what you use to cluster Samba. And uh, actually, CTDB speaks native Rados as it stores its <laughs> yeah, lock, it store object lock object in the, underneath. So, um, that's that's the kind of <laughs> yeah, basics there. Exactly. Right. You've got the the native and non-native, and they kind of intertwine depending on what your client really needs, right? Um, because the the iSCSI layer is another layer as well that you can put on top of the block side, which is uh, definitely used very often as well. So either you're lucky and your applications can consume Ceph natively because yep. it can just, like Mitch said earlier, it can speak to all the OSDs directly and you get massive parallelism out of the cluster. Yep, yep. Or if it doesn't, Use some gateways, use something like iSCSI, use like Samba, use NFS, mm -hmm. um, anything that can take a file system and, and translate it yeah, that way. Or iSCSI for blocks, or then there's the, the other way of speaking now, native S3. Something I think is important to mention too, I, I, I've seen people asking this, um, you know, you can start with really anything. You you could probably uh, go, could you go all the way down to a Raspberry Pi, and, even though it's not great idea, yeah. but to test stuff, you could say, this is one of my nodes. Yep. So I, I'm not 100% sure what the status of ARM Ceph is. Okay. I know it's been built. I don't know how package well is it packages yeah. built. We it, haven't done it. We here haven't done it. But yeah. There's plenty. There's of packages. Yeah. There definitely is. Uh, uh, I just don't know how well maintained. But like, it's definitely there. Uh, and if you've got the skill, you can there. do it. Um, well, what were you? You were. You bought a Steam Deck. Actually, you, yeah, tell that crazy. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're going to my idea here because I'm going to do this. So uh, if you guys know of the Steam Deck, so the Steam Deck runs on Linux, Arch Linux underneath. And so what my idea is is to get three of them and build a Ceph cluster on the three of them on Wi-Fi and have people walking around the office kind of playing in the video. It should be pretty fun. <laughs> But yeah, to uh, your point, Tom, yeah, absolutely. For for a lab, for a home lab, Ceph is so much more accessible than, than people may realize. Um, it's very, very easy to spin up even a one node Ceph yeah. cluster, right? Obviously, clusters being used in a, in a strange way there, but you are, you're you still able to do replication. You're still able to do erasure coding. Um, obviously, there's no failover at the server level, but you can have you can still have self-healing, right? If a drive fails and, and you set your failure domain to the OSD level, you're still going to have self-healing amongst the drive. So it is very accessible. Um, when we say OSD, we mean physical disk. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. OSD equals one physical disk. So when Mitch says failure domain at the OSD level, we're saying replicate all these objects such that each OSD gets one disk copy. gets an individual copy of it. Well, and this is an important thing I want to bring up for the home lab people that listen to this is that, yes, you can go grab a handful of old machines that don't have redundancy because you're building this for a learning experience and turn them into Ceph cluster. Matter of fact, you probably want to do some redundancy because you're using a bunch of old equipment that you've stacked around or a bunch of Steam decks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and create some redundancy. So, yeah, this is very accessible for people. The minimum requirements are Linux and boots <laughs> yeah exactly like linux and boots and a storage disk yeah and, and even to that point you could even get a little hacky and just make file file disks right yeah. make a yeah. loop back device and and just uh you know for testing purposes but yeah ideally you'd have at least one disk or three disks for a three rep or and, you know, if you're doing a ratio, and if it's possible on a raspberry pi we'll have to ask chef gearling so hey, hey, right oh. absolutely yeah, he's okay, he's gonna. Anyway. Build, if there's anyone who built it, I'm just gonna. I'll message Jeff. Jeff, I got an idea. Well, <laughs> you know, this topic, another idea. You see the ZFS video he did where yeah. he took one from sixty. That was that two was, drives on a single yeah. Raspberry Pi. I was that amazed. Was great. I mean, he's like compiling drivers and everything. So I guarantee, oh, yeah. like, if if it can be done, Jeff will be the person who can do it mm -hmm. <laughs> with the Raspberry Pi. That'd be For cool. Sure. 
we've got a lot of kind of crossover with him and us. Like we love Ansible here. We use Ansible for uh, deploying a lot of things. And he's a big, big Ansible guy. I believe oh, yeah. he's got the development for Ansible and things like oh, that. Oh, Gearling so. guy. He's, yeah. I see his playbooks around here. <laughs> I've used yep. a couple times. Yeah. So. Definitely a great person. I interact sure. with him a lot online. So, uh, but no, this is, I, I'm glad that it's so accessible. It's one of the things I wanted to, you know, make sure people know we're not just talking about something that's used in the enterprise, but it's something you can learn at home. You can learn on your home lab. This is at, right in the ballpark because it sounds like stuff, you know, we're talking about 11 petabytes and home users going, that'd be great for my movie collection, but it's a lot of my budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we touched on, you're right. It's, it's, it's not that hard to get into it. But we're really talking about from the hardware side there and how much you need. Yep. But like the other side of this coin is standing the thing up and Building installing it. it. Like yep. you go to the documentation sometimes of things, you're like, oh, I'm excited. If anyone's tried to spin up a little Kubernetes node or cluster before, I think I've been trying for a couple of years now. <laughs> I get, get scared halfway, halfway through. Um, but Seth's done a lot of good work in the last few years because they do. Sorry, I always tell stories by adding context <laughs> but they every year the cef team will do a a um, survey survey and get yeah. information of what's the most important for their users what they want to see moving forward so for the longest time people are like i love it it's awesome but it's cryptic and really hard to get set up lower the barrier for entry lower yeah. the barrier for entry so on the hardware side yeah you can start with one node but now um this is a whole other can of worms but like cef adm and the way that they very easily can deploy a Ceph cluster now yeah. it's you can you can kind of start like that without any real um um knowledge yeah, where it, before it's mons and managers and exactly. osds and oh how many networks do i need and stuff like that is yeah. they've really reduced that entry of the learning curve as well 100%. too and what i love about Ceph is kind of the same uh philosophy we take to solving people's problems is start don't start in the weeds. Start up high. What problem are you going to solve? Don't make it only make it as complex as you as need it needs to, to be. Yeah. So Steph has really gotten to the point now where you can just spin up a node and you can, and you can use it as your movie. You can use it as your home home lab. That's no yep. issue at all. Yep. But then as you get crazier and crazier down the rabbit hole of Seth, you can expand it further and be like, oh my God, what can't this thing do? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. And how bulletproof is this thing? <laughs> yeah. And, I think, uh, yeah. The, the, don't make things more complex. That's just a general good overall, because from either a network engineering standpoint or even a storage design standpoint, uh, you, you want to build solutions you can support for your clients. So for those of you from the go, like, move from the home lab to the the consulting and the business world that uh, me and the team have 45 drives here and on. Um, we know we have to support what we sell. So it's not like a home lab project. It's like, no, I have to be able to train this. So if you are thinking you have to use Ceph, or I've been asked when I've talked about solutions, why we didn't use Ceph, I'm like, it, that level of complexity, because it was a single server with no plans of an expanded one, wasn't necessary for it. Um, so, it's, you know, it's, it's still some considerations to take in there of how you build it out. From a learning opportunity, do full complicated, it's how you learn things. And mm -hmm. it's how you <laughs> figure right. out Kubernetes. Um, right. after, that's how you learn yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's how you learn yeah. stuff. Um, it's it's definitely to, not deploying. Just not production. Deploying is nice. It gets you uh, part of the way. Yeah. When things break, that's really when you start to learn. <laughs> right. It's not right. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, but yeah, no, well, sorry, I was just going to mention something there. Oh, yeah. So to, to touch on the, the way that uh, the Ceph has done. So like in the early days when they had their first orchestration tool, Ceph Deploy, it was very cryptic, right? And it, it was hard to deploy a cluster. Then like things like Ceph Ansible came along definitely improved it a lot a lot where you just kind of had to know a little bit about ansible fill in some variables and it would build the cluster for you then they went and that's their, this is their current kind of orchestration tool of ceph adm and to brett's point you can literally build bootstrap a cluster in like two or three commands and you can have your your services up and running um and they have a nice little dashboard now yeah they never had before it was yep. all command line only so um everyone loves a good dashboard to uh Get a little comfortable and then then dive in deeper so yeah exactly uh but obviously shameless plug if anyone does really want to get into uh ceph clustering we do have a two-day uh ceph boot camp that yeah. we just started offering <laughs> yeah definitely i mean i might join that too <laughs> <laughs> i'm not i'm not the ceph expert that's why i got these guys on here <laughs> hmm. um uh, what about performance so there's obviously some performance considerations and this is where i think they're can be some challenges versus native. So uh, 
you're adding extraction layers between you and the raw disk itself. First, the file system, the disk sons, ZFS or whatever. Then it's talking to the Ceph system. Then it's presenting to, let's say, a hypervisor, for example. Uh, what are some performance considerations versus native? I mean, we love the expandability of storage. We made that easy. But how much overhead is Ceph adding? And what, what are the considerations when you're designing? Great question. Yep. So I'll just be blunt right now. Ceph, Ceph itself is the bottleneck. Uh, it's just because there's so many layers. Like you will kind of exhaust the software before you'll exhaust the hardware in the 100%. system. Yep. But you get so many great things about it. Um, also, I want to make one little clarification too. When Ceph uses a storage disk, it uses it natively uses the whole thing. There is no file system on the desk. It consumes the whole block device and puts its own kind of uh, right. native way Database of speaking. Of speaking it. It's called yeah. Blue Store. Yep. Previously, Ceph always used something called File Store, which it did put a file system and then put objects on top of that. That put even more overhead. In, which in really, <laughs> when that got built, was. Um, approval. It was just like we're going to start here, start but there, we yeah. natively have to put objects on there. So, like when you. With overhead, you're right. There's still all those layers on top, but Ceph puts the OSD directly on the disk and then exports it. Has it definitely improved that considerably. Um, but with Ceph, right, because Ceph is so one of the most important things when they were developing it was consistency, right? Keeping consistency above all, and so performance came later, right? And so anytime you're going to build a cluster where synchronous writes are required, meaning all copies of an object have to be committed before an acknowledgement goes back to a client, there is going to be a little bit of sacrifice in latency. Um, and Particularly so on the right path. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, when we say that we stay on the right path reads, um, especially yeah, reads are fantastic in Ceph um, if you do it right. And so yeah, like there, there's definitely some considerations. However, that being said, there's also ways to mitigate it and really get it as as low as humanly possible. Um, but if someone was to say take on a Ceph cluster for their first cluster and say, I want to put a low latency database on this thing, I would say, you, there's some considerations you want to make and some some definitely design choices you want to make to make sure you can hit that. Um, but when we're talking streaming rights, um, streaming rights, Ceph can handle that very well, especially if you've got a lot of clients hitting it. It looks beautiful when you kind of scale back and look at the uh, kind of overall throughput that can go into a, a Ceph cluster, or even a, like a reasonable size. And that's it. To get the to get the most out of your Ceph cluster, it, you're going to want to have a lot of parallel access into it. Yeah. If you're just going to build one application that just talks to your Ceph cluster, it, it you just leave a lot of performance on the table yeah. because it really is built to be scaled out and everything. So the the only place where Ceph's performance will leave a little lacking, mm -hmm. I find, is that small, random, low latency workload that you yep. need out of it. That That's where something like maybe a single ZFS server or something will be we'll superior, be superior. To it. Yep. In every other way, though, stream and writes, reads, yep. like even random reads out of the thing. Yep. Ceph's fast, 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 fast. And particularly now that it's so able to handle um, a mix of, of HDDs and spinners mm -hmm. and, and even the kind of concept of hybrid OSDs with, yep. with dedicated journals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what he means by that is is essentially when you have an OSD in Ceph, really it's an OSD, a blue store OSD, I should say, is made up of three parts. It's made up of the block, like, like uh, he mentioned, you literally are writing directly to the block of the disk. And then two other parts. One's a RocksDB, which is a, a key store database that essentially keeps track of where that data has been written on the, on the block, as well as metadata about the object. And then there's a write-ahead log. And that write-ahead log is obviously for journaling if power outages, but it also does a really cool like feature. If, if yeah, exactly. From the ZFS yep. world. Uh, but another really cool feature it has is it's deferred writes. So if you take that wall DB and that... Uh, or sorry, wall NDB, and put it on an SSD where you still have the block on the on the HDD, but you take a small, relatively small SSD, like a 480 gig SSD could typically handle up to three HDDs, and you take the RocksDB and wall and you put it on the SSD, that can considerably improve performance. Like it definitely reduces latency by like an order of magnitude in many situations. Um, but, and that write ahead log by, by having deferred writes where essentially as soon as it's committed to that uh, wall, it can then acknowledge back to the client. So it doesn't have to write to, to the long-term HDD to get that act back. And so that's where you can really crawl back some of your uh, lower latency performance. But there's some caveats to that, of course, as well, right? Your, D, your wall is only uh, so large. So if you fill that up, latency is going to spike, right? Because you have to wait for everything to flush back. Um, so, but in bursty workloads, that can really, really improve uh, Ceph's uh, random or, or small write performance.
it, it's very similar in reminds me of how the uh when you have the slog on a zfs yeah, exactly you can, you can concept. Same right exact concept yep. yeah same yeah, concept very concepts the same yeah yep um, and then for CephFS, just to quickly touch on CephFS and why CephFS is really cool, is it, it deploys what's called a metadata server. And so it's a daemon, like every other kind of Ceph service, that will essentially hold a high-performance RAM uh, cache in RAM of some of the most recently accessed metadata. Uh, or it'll store as much as you can, really. You can grow it, you know, 30 gigs if you've got the space there. And so for, you know, clients that are looking to do a lookup on a directory with potentially thousands of files, rather than that client having to go contact the OSDs directly and pull that metadata off of the disks where it does reside, it can actually just go to the metadata server and say, hey, I'm looking for the metadata for all of this directory. And it can get that very, very quickly back to the client. Um, so that's another really cool feature of Ceph, that centralized metadata. Yeah, and because you nailed it there, and with go going too far down uh, uh, the cluster comparison, <laughs> that is where CephFS really scales well. Because we mentioned earlier, distributed file systems are hard to do. They're hard yep. to do at scale, and they're hard to do such that the latency just doesn't kill you mm -hmm. when you're doing metadata stuff. And what's metadata stuff? <laughs> you know, like searching for files. Searching for like files. You, go, yeah. you open a directory in your file explorer in your Samba share, and it's, yep, <laughs> as everything cool. loads in. Exactly. Um, and from a use case standpoint, I mean, we deal with it as you guys do as well. And well, some of them are the same clients, um, clients that have like a thousands. We have a, a couple of movie companies you work with. And when they do the 3D renderings, um, they actually have these cool camera systems, but they take thousands of pictures a second to create these image maps. One of yeah, them, yeah. the cool thing is we actually got to work with the studio uh, that had did the 3D mapping for uh, the one of the Pirates of the Caribbean one. They were So we got to, they have a sizzle reel and everything they show. It was so cool how they do it of how real that looks when you watch a movie but that was a stitching of thousands of images then they 3d map them but one of the challenges when they do a lookup this it has to cool. be it says i need these files and there's thousands of them so that's where these metadata things with Ceph can kick into high gear and actually solve a problem for them because they got to query it they have to go all right we need um day two on the set <laughs> the <laughs> ship we had to pull this and it goes grind 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 mm -hmm. waiting for it to do and you just see all the hard drives slide up so it's kind of when you think about those scalable storage solutions like that it's really interesting to see the impact they have in the real world use case of indexing that many files to create that metadata 100 yeah. that's actually a use case that's very close to one of our largest clusters um it's i won't say who it is but it's essentially they call it the wildfire project i'm sure there's many of them out there and what happens is they take it's not film it's not video that's constantly recording so it's not one large file they take thousands of images on each camera it's essentially cameras that are positioned all through the the forest to uh indicate you know wildfires or, or things like that and so they have some of the most metadata heavy clusters i've ever seen I was amazed like massive metadata. massive metadata pool uh co especially compared to the data right i've never seen that type of ratio and so there has definitely been some some tuning on that side to get the metadata performance to really perform at scale at, at that type of metadata level but that's where those uh non-standard like the 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 norms don't come into play and you got to tune a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Which then yeah. prompts that like the defaults are always a good idea yeah. until your crazy use case starts to push them to not work. Yeah. Then you start tuning one option yeah. at a time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of the, actually, cause we talked about this before we went live, how, you know, we've seen them and I'm sure people have also seen it as well. The, the over tuner where you go into the comp file and it's, you know, like, looks like, looks like a novel. Yeah. And I've seen that. We've seen that many times you go in, they say, my cluster is not working or my server's not working. It's too slow. And you literally just clean that comp file out to default and just look at the cluster, start singing again and start performing extremely well. Yeah. For, for the, in the defaults are set and this goes across most products, not just Ceph, the defaults are set for an optimal experience out of the box. So right. unless you're doing, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> 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 um, and, and trying to film something like that scale, generally speaking, the defaults work really well with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now we'll touch on it real quick because this was a discussion. I think it's worth at least bringing it up because I, I know at least someone's want to know um, are some of these features because you have some familiarity with Gluster as well. Is some of that caching feature is that you said not a feature in Gluster or is it just an, have the scalability on that? Okay, so um, we we as Forty Five Drive started our cluster adventure as we're going to sell Gluster clusters and. Um, a great learning curve on it. Glusterfest and Glusterfest is a solid product. It works really well. You need some shared storage quickly. 
done. It's easy. It's easy if you understand uh, file systems at all. Even in the most basic, you'll be yep. able to get a cluster cl or a cluster cluster up with it without issue. Yep. The problem with clusters is there is no centralized metadata. So as it gets really big and you start to look for stuff, uh, it just, <laughs> just can't do it, and it just slows down. And you get the and how we and really the the indicator, the support ticket we'd get into us was my files don't list. And it just spins forever, forever and ever. And then we, there was millions of different ways to try it and everything. And then um, ultimately when we went, you know what, Ceph is the right way to do this. It was, that's how they chose to solve that problem. Well, first of all, we need a centralized metadata server. We need to look up things quickly. And, uh, but it needs to be in the Ceph way. Like that's why it's called Ceph, right? It's after cephalopods. Yeah. There is, it's distributed. There's no way to kill it. Yep. Like you got to yeah. take it all out, right? Yep. So they, they took... That's how they solved the distributed file system challenge. Yep. And, and really, that's the biggest uh, Achilles heel to Gluster, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, nothing nothing wrong with the project at all. Actually, shared storage works really well, especially if you just need a couple VMs. Like yeah, you hit the nail on the head. On, on If you're if you're doing something and you want to do a spin it up quickly or you have a certain scale that you're never going to exceed, it's fantastic for sure. Um, that being said, like I know I have and maybe you have been keeping track of Gluster development and anything that's changed over the last few years. Like its versioning scheme? Yeah, or years. if they ever put together something like centralized metadata of any kind. Because I I'm if they did, I'm, not, I'm unaware of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good answer too. Once we kind of went down the Ceph road, uh, we paid a little close attention to Gluster, but we've kind of just let it be its own thing. So yeah. if anything I said there was a little dated, well, <laughs> that's we're why. Guys now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and that's a that's a good point though. I mean, you you tried it, and this is where you know you you are careful to select products because ultimately it comes down to I don't just recommend something. I'm not just playing with this. I actually have you know as we both do clients we have to support for the solutions exactly. we sell. Um, and we, they have agreements that this should work, that they should be able to list their files. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a fun topic, though. And it's funny because someone coincidentally posted this. And this is what we, we said we're going to do. So I, I don't know where this information or this bad information comes from. Do you need 10 gigabit to make stuff work? Uh, nope. Great, great question. That's something that you're, you're definitely going to hear very often. People are going to yell at you for even mentioning, I want to try to build stuff on one gigabit. Um, should, should we tell them? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so 45 drives and, and, and our sister company, Protocase, we serve what, over 400, uh, you, 400 people that work here. Um, we have a one gigabit Ceph cluster that serves those 400 people. Um, and we're actually doing a video on this right now. And we're, we're just talking about kind of building a cluster at the, at the lowest scale. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to interview some of the people that, that use it day by day. We all have our public drive that we map to our, our workstations and see how they think it works. And, uh, people are very happy. Let's say, well, we'll do a little spoiler. Right. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you're doing any crazy work, like this is a business file server, right? We're using documents and we got the yeah. odd ISOs. And a lot, like a that. lot, lot of video rendering. Video rendering. Yep. Yeah. Chris McGee yep. does a lot there. Uh, um, Protocase's main work is a lot of CAD kind CAD, of architectural yep. type work, too. Yep. So there's a lot of and then the entire manufacturing plant of the other side of the company. Everyone's. Um, uh, uh, they're pods. Oh, yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. All connect to the to the one gig store drive. And the thing is, is it just works. It just works. But yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little hint on why it became this way and actually kind of leads me into uh, why Ceph can be great and well, things we run into is uh, when we first started evaluating Ceph to be like, all right, we want to use this. What's the best way to find out if it's going to work? Well, you got to use it yourself. And you yep. got to use it yourself, not in a lab. You got to use it for real. Mm -hmm. Because if it solves your problem, it solves your problem. Mm -hmm. But um, so when it, and the, the the boss, the owner there, and I, I, we're building this F cluster. Um, and he said, sure, you're not buying any new network gear, though. And I was <laughs> like, all right, so we're building it on a one gig then. And uh, we put it in place, and it was kind of one of those, it was like, oh, hope this works. And then anything, it, it's been working. We've been, been using it for six years now. Yep. And uh, <laughs> and the thing is, is everything keeps kind of building on top of it. Mm -hmm. So and, and just to explain why, like, also the reason why we've never uh, kind of put it back up to 10 gig or put it up to 10 gig in all these years didn't need to and like we we span multiple buildings right and some of the buildings are literally line of sight wi-fi so we have like one gigabit connection into a lot of these buildings so while it may help on the back end it just it was never necessary and um and, and to that point um we we spread the Ceph cluster out to we do, all yep. the buildings, not the line of sight ones, the Wi-Fi yes, latency yeah, that, that's a little so too high. We can't do that. But yep. like, yeah, and then we have the redundancy that way because we're, we've talked about everything so, so far about the performance it gives, 
but performance is one side of the coin, one side right. of the multi-sided coin of stability, stability reliability. Yep. And what was the most important to us was server maintenance mm -hmm. or one of the Lack buildings, of. one of the buildings, <laughs> honestly, was on some, was not the greatest power grid. Yeah. So it would die all the time. Yep. So we needed to be able to have this thing stay up and highly available. Yep. And that's really, you don't need 10 gig. You can get by with one gig mm -hmm. and it may be because you don't care about your performance so much, but you want to cluster because you want your storage to be up and highly available all yep. the time. And that's where Seth can really be useful. It's not always about getting the most performance. Yep. It's about solving your need. Yep, definitely. And then, so obviously, I, if there is some kind of uh, Seth people in the comments before we get uh, ripped on, the one caveat I would say about a one gigabit Seth cluster is re rebuilding, like self-healing. If you do have drive failures, that does take considerably longer, yep. right? On on a one gig network yeah. than would on ten gig. So self healing is definitely a bit of a factor. So, uh, but I mean, we're pro proof is in the pudding as to like we've had this cluster up for for many years and many people using it. Um, that being said, like if if you ask how many of our customers clusters are are one gigabit, it is a fraction of a fraction of customers because people just want. You know they have 10 gig in place so why not right so um there's definitely very few that are on one gig of our customers but we definitely have proved that and it's possible that's kind of what we're here to do <laughs> to kind of like spread the word of for those who think that you you're like oh we're not big enough for a seth cluster or we don't really do yes that. exactly yeah, buy it buy a floor bay server from us by yep. the the mi4 put it on one gig if if you just want your critical infrastructure to stay critical and stay up like we kind of want to spread the good word of like <laughs> This isn't a big scary tech that's only for like the high end stuff. Every, everyone can get into it. Yeah, you, you, yeah. And it's it's relatively inexpensive to set up your back end, a, a couple servers, a ten gig internet connects between them. But maybe yep. on the front end, where the clients interact because exactly. budget is less budget friendly, that yep. can go over the higher latency links. But the it's Ceph cluster hard. itself communicates over a very stable lower latency connection because that's an important thing. Is as we do have to say because your numbers wrong <laughs> and you're wrong on the internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we balance fast if there's one gig links between these and we you leave them out and have to rebuild it. Yep. <laughs> You'll always be limited by that pipe. Yep, hundred yeah. percent. <laughs> Very cool. It seems like I've seen a lot of really good questions on here too. So it looks like we got a lot of Ceph fans in here. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Ceph maintenance is easy. Just shut down server node and fix anything you want. Uh, nobody will notice. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> he's, know exactly. He's not wrong. Yeah, he's not wrong. <laughs> set, set the maintenance flags first, though. Yeah. The, the one thing, though, they're right there, but there is a series of maintenance flags and the dashboard is easy now. You can just pretty much hit maintenance mode. But Ceph, if it senses that the node or disks are down longer than, what is it? 600. 600. Is it 600 yeah. by default? 600 yeah. seconds by default, so 10 minutes. It will start rebalancing the data. If you're going into maintenance mode, you probably don't want your data to move around. You just want to turn it off, leave everything in place, and turn it back on. So, yes, it is that simple, but you do have to turn on the don't move my data around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's um, – and I guess that's – there's a lot of – this goes into pre-planning and making sure that there's a level of redundancy, how you set the erasure so it can rebuild those things. Um, the data would still be available when you lose a node, provided you have a redundancy in it. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, kind of a more deeply technical question is, let's say I want to take a physical box and set up stuff on it. So I load stuff. Does it have to have a couple extra drives that it'll load that file essentially it's uh, rock db and everything on um so i have like a boot drive that's small and basic to get the os up and running and then the rest of the drives are dedicated like you just pointed at the raw data or raw drives themselves essentially yeah so ceph uses lvm uh you can use lvm to build your blue store osd so yeah you'd have your boot drive that's where your linux os would be on um your monitor database would also typically be stored on there as well on your boot drives and then when you go to build your Ceph cluster, your OSDs, let's say you have three disks in there. Well, you could run a single command that will run a batch command and, and build an OSD on all three of those disks. If you don't have the dedicated flash, what it will do is it will put the DB, the wall, and the block all on the single device for you by default. And 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 to the question too, uh, yeah, if you want this data to re actually, this is kind of what I want to say. When you... Think ZFS, your traditional, or just think hardware RAID, just think your traditional RAID. If you lose a disk in that array, mm -hmm. it's down. You are degraded until you fix it. What we mean by Ceph is kind of a living storage organism. I think close to the question you just asked is, if you lose a disk in Ceph, it'll go, that's okay, I got some more. 
and it will regenerate that data and bring itself back to a healthy state. So yep. you can, as an admin, maybe a day or two later, actually go replace the disk. So to your question, yes, you do need another space, but all disks are consumed at once once you build that that storage system. Yeah, you never have a hot spare. It, it's not like it's sitting there as a hot spare. What Seth thinks about in that case, it doesn't think, oh, I have another OSD I can use. It just says, oh, I have more space I can use, and it'll redistribute. So you can kind of think of like, I don't know, say I had three cups of water and I took one away, but, oh, I need, I'm, I'm missing volume. I need to regenerate this somewhere. Well, if I had that fourth cup, a fourth node somewhere else, Seth will just be like, okay, well, I'll take this data, I'll regenerate it over here and then kind of rebalance it so it's all smooth like that. So yes, you need to have a little bit of extra space, but where that extra space comes in depends on what your failure domain is. If we say storage pool, I want you to keep three copies of the data and I need you to do it on the host level, meaning that every individual storage server will have one copy of that data. If I only have three hosts in my cluster and I lose one, it it's will stay good. kind of like the traditional RAID state. It'll stay degraded yep. until I bring that other server back or give it a new, a new, new server. one and it can regenerate itself on that. Yep. If we had that same scenario, three servers, but our failure domain was the OSD level, yep. meaning that each individual disk got a copy of the data mm -hmm. and I lose lost one of those servers, it'd be like, all right, that's fine. And it would just regenerate it on the OSDs. Now, using OSDs in production as the failure domain is not ideal because as you can probably pick out right away, all it means is be on three unique devices Yep. But all three of those devices might live in the same server. Yeah, because it's random. Eventually, some object is going to end up with all copies on a single host. And then if that host goes down, well, now you've got some lost data. That's why we'll typically not do the, the OSD failure domain level. But if you've got a one node Ceph cluster at home, what we would do is set that OSD failure domain. And then should, like, let's say you've got a seven drives on that server and you do a two plus one erasure code, that will put two data chunks on two different drives and one parity chunk on another drive. And then let's say one of the drive with the data chunk fails. It will take uh, the last remaining data chunk and the parity chunk. It will regenerate that data chunk on one of the remaining six drives. And then it'll just keep doing that uh, until you're back to a fully healthy state. So there's kind of two modes of Ceph. You can run it like a traditional RAID array and literally have it just enough space. And when something fails, it'll be degraded until you bring it back or you can use it as it's been designed, like a living storage, storage organism, and have a little extra, an extra node, a little hard, extra hard drives in, and it'll just rebuild itself so you can kind of fix whatever broke yep. at a later date without worrying, oh, I better hurry up. Exactly, another yeah, before another one fails. And, and it's funny, because I realized when talking about, and I talk about this stuff all very often, it's very hard to help visualize without like a visual representation when we're talking about these things. They're very abstract. Um, so without like a slide deck, it's really hard to just like show exactly what's happening every step in the way. Or, or maybe it's not. Maybe I just feel like it's it's hard to explain. Yeah. <laughs> the good news is I have a lot of links I put in the description. So you guys have an entire series oh, yeah. on stuff. So you, you can spend a lot of hours after you're done listening to this podcast uh, <laughs> watching visual representations and that's slide right. decks and yeah, exactly. uh, everything else. But that's one of the things we try to do is we'll talk about it here, but we, we want to send you a little homework if this is a yeah. project. If you want there's because there's actually a lot of homework it's a um there's a lot of learning to do inside of this but i, I think it's one of the things in the base thing with Ceph. so you built this small stuff like we're talking about if you built an individual thing in your home lab but one of the real benefits of it is the thing that people hate about you know building storage servers especially when you mentioned some of the zfs is it's more difficult to expand Ceph, you're like just grab another oh, node yes. yeah. add it to the and then, then they become friends really quick and now you have x plus that much more storage like yeah. you said, add another node, or it could be as simple. Maybe you've bought enough nodes. Like maybe you bought four. You don't need them all full, and you only quarter fill the slots in them. Just slap a couple more. Discs. Yeah, you can expand the individual nodes yeah. as well in the same way. So that's really cool. Working with DFS and Ceph and, and seeing how they compare and contrast, I've really come to the realization that there's some things in ZFS that I would love to see. Like the way that if you fill a single VDEV in, in ZFS up, like let's say 70%, and you add another's VDEV in, wouldn't it be amazing if ZFS self-healed or self-balanced itself and put some of the data on that first VDEV on the second one? So you're then at a very level uh, 
playing field for both the V devs. So you don't fill one and then only use the other one where you're, you're not getting that striping performance. Um, whereas Ceph has that built in, right? Same thing for metadata, right? If you had a special V dev, if you add that in, like after the fact, like you build your Z pool and you've been using it for, you know, eight months and then you realize, darn, a special V dev would really help. It'd be really cool if you could put that V dev in and then the metadata would just, you know, hydrate over into the V dev. Again, that's something that Ceph just kind of does for you. Um, automatically. So those are the kind of things that just, ah, I, I love ZFS. Like ZFS is one of, one of my favorite topics. Uh, but like those things with the self-healing and self-managing that Ceph has would be wonderful if ZFS could do. That's what it does better than any other system. The, the kind of, I said it a couple of times, but like the organism, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's alive. Yeah. It, it, it's they're doing its own things. It has thoughts and feelings. No, yeah. <laughs> it's sneaky <laughs> like the yeah. Google AI. Yeah, like that, the Google, that guy. No, don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I think this is, I seen someone ask this earlier about like, you know, do you build it with NVMe? Does it have full, was it RDMA support? I think that's where we kind of answered that question with the performance. If you are absolutely need the best in class performance and squeezing the most out of hardware, probably Ceph is not a layer you want to put between you and your NVMe array you built. Mm -hmm. so, probably be an easiest way to describe that like if someone wants because we run into this occasionally and you know there's the people who just want the absolute and for a good reason they have a database application that is just it's going to hammer these drives and we think mvme might be fast enough for how many queries you know yep. think social media companies and stuff like that mm -hmm. that go all right this is going to get hammered on so that's where it may not be the best fit you want to be as close to the hardware uh as possible i'll assume so it's yep. that good assessment very very real um use cases for NVMe and a Ceph cluster, but I would put them as like support uses. So an index pool for object storage, for indexing your metadata, your CephFS metadata pool. Um, if you have enough space, putting your RocksDB, your wall and on NVMe, those are where I really see the benefit of using yeah. NVMe and, and it's Ceph. It's very economical too, because then it's not, it's you're not building an NVMe yeah. cluster. You're exactly. building a spinning cluster with, with some the NVMe's to help you out. Yep. Yeah. And I, we completely agree with you. Uh, Ceph's awesome, but it's stability and scalability first and performance. So if you want that bare metal, I want every IOP out of my NVMe drive, then yeah, you got to get as close to metal as possible. Yep. Yeah. And there may be a day that Ceph could do it. They are definitely Crimson moving store. towards C-Store. Yeah, C -store. Yeah. They've got Crimson. They've got some really cool things in the pipe um, because like just seeing the, the latency decrease from file store to blue store, itself like really it was like 2.5 percent or 2.5 times performance improvement on flash and so they're definitely working towards that um and so it's it's really bright future for set for sure it's, it's only growing oh yeah because the it's not that there's not a demand in the enterprise market for something performance it's just it doesn't exist today right. and most businesses in the deployment, this is, you know, I talk about this when I do Wi-Fi as well. They're not going, how fast is the Wi-Fi? They're going, we want the most connectivity. Because <laughs> this, it's not about the data that they're sending in terms of speed. They're usually sending a smaller amount of data. It's about the availability of 100% uptime if possible. You know, everyone wants the five nines of uptime. They want, anytime someone hits that list, you know, we don't have time for our, our uh, server to not have these movies available for us of our editors to work. <laughs> if it stops, I have an entire editing team of like the i think there's 50 people that work at this one company he goes wow. they have nothing to do in the server spinning <laughs> so yeah the heads start popping up yeah heads start popping <laughs> up everyone's like around. i guess we're going hanging outside yeah. today yeah <laughs> you have the groundhog effect yeah <laughs> you it down. What's, what's going on yeah <laughs> but yeah so this was awesome uh this was a lot of fun I, I, is there any last minute questions before we wind this up that you guys seen in the comments passing by that we should touch on um there was there was a couple, but my goldfish memory is <laughs> okay. more of a shout out to Michael Kidd. You've a lot, a lot of helpful answers for everyone in there. So, uh, yep. yeah, we definitely have some Ceph users in the comments mm -hmm. here as well. So the, the, as some of the, I think some of the questions kind of got answered to some of the off questions and we answered them kind of along the way as well. And then wow. I said, I have all the links down below to like way more learning. Cause this is not, um, this is by not, uh, no means a complete Ceph course. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And just two of the links that we put in. So like there's some 45 drive ones. I think uh, Chris, our, our videographer, director, yep. marketer extraordinaire, sent a couple <laughs> more. Um, but there's two in particular. There's one uh, place. It's about placement groups. People love to ask all the time, what are placement groups? We didn't even get anywhere close to that today. But it's kind of the last piece of black magic of Ceph of like, uh, how does that actually work? There's a 30 minute talk by someone 
uh, in the Ceph community, and it is the best analogy I've ever heard. So I, I encourage okay, people to watch that. Okay, that's linked in there. I, do, I already added that to the one as well. That, that's awesome. the tennis ball coach one. I, I love it. <laughs> and uh, there's another one on there. It's called Solving or Ceph, the bug of the year. And it's uh, all yeah. about how CERN, everyone, I'm sure everyone knows CERN, yeah. the experiment over in Europe. Um, uh, they, they are big, big Ceph users. Uh, majority of their data actually lives on Ceph clusters. And uh, it's just a really, really cool story about how a, how a tiny little bug toppled like a good chunk of their storage, how they solve it, how they fix it, and some of the takeaways of it, of like how the one that really stuck with it. And so first of all, I encourage watching that. It, I learned a lot just from watching their process yeah. of solving there it. My, I put it in my, my watch list. That's what I'm going to watch tonight because that's cool. I consume, we were talking about this earlier, I mostly consume YouTube. I don't watch much TV, but I watch yeah. YouTube and I watch things like that, talks that are given. I love yeah. that all the DEF CON talks are, are on there, everything. Like and anything I want to learn about, I can go we watch. We to talk about it all. It's yeah. so much fun. We're not and, hiding it behind any kind of uh, right. curtain. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, so yeah, CERN, Zeph, the great talk there. And, and really what it was, was Seth became so stable and awesome for them that they put everything, everything on, on it. Ceph that when one little bug broke it, it, it toppled everything's things that shouldn't have been where they, and they in their lines were like, hmm, we should, should compartmentalize a little bit. So when you ask yourself, do I need a 50 petabyte cluster? <laughs> Probably not. Probably need to break it in chunks or, you know, you end up like the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is, that's a fun analogy right there. Um, I, I seen this, I think we touched on it because we said cluster in certain limitations with cluster other than maybe they've fixed some of them, but is there any other cluster file systems that you've played with uh, besides stuff that you think may be better? Or you guys are just, all in on stuff because I don't I, besides stuff and cluster I can't even think of another one. Okay, so Luster is by far yeah, the Luster. fastest cluster file system there is it, for sequential reads and writes. It doesn't compare, but uh, if you're going to factor in everything, like I said, performance is one side of the coin. Right. Um, nothing does if you're going to build something massive and critical that people are going to trust above all. For performance is the first thing they ask about, but if the thing breaks, like uh, yeah. say, well, if you color outside of lines, the thing topples. Yeah, <laughs> stability and scalability need to be number one. So nothing touches Ceph on that. Agreed. Yeah, and and even like I said earlier, bare metal is where you got to go if you want the performance. You just can't expect sure. yet. And you know, the, the, with the level of engineering we are here in July of 2022, <laughs> does not offer uh, Ceph performance that matches bare metal. That's just and I don't know, as bare metal gets faster, you know, when you start thinking about some of the uh, stuff and Wendell from level one, Texas certainly done some deep dives about talking about that of, you know, how you pipeline things. He's got, I, I think he modified a few things so he can pipeline things better through the, so you're bypassing CPU going into network, going into what is it? The, is it RDMA? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You get direct performance. I and mean, that's it, it, the bare metal keeps pushing further away. So it's, it's a, keep chasing game so bare metal still the performance <laughs> and, and that's just how it works software defined storage is amazing it's flexible you can yep. get anything running on pretty standard hardware the trade-off is not bare metal yep and there's yep. some abstraction layers in between yeah and for these large companies doing stuff you, you just need that because the i don't know what runs the back end of like facebook or any of those but any of these big social media companies they, they're running some type of distributed file system because they're distributing mm -hmm. it globally uh mm -hmm. it, it solves these problems at scale they they can't think about bare metal that's not yeah. <laughs> they, they think about uptime and making sure people's cat pictures are there <laughs> Very fact, fun fact actually that rocks db that we discussed that was actually developed at facebook okay yep you know, it's, it, for all the things that we can dislike Facebook for, we can thank them for, uh, is it Z standard compression, uh, <laughs> rocks TV. There's a few things that they've actually, uh, been a good contributor for the open source because React. yeah, that's yeah. at least they've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for joining us. As I said, all the links are down below. This was a great episode. And I think we're going to do some videos together, me and the 45 drives. We have, uh, we have some more plans. So go ahead and leave comments and all that of uh, on, on YouTube or reach out to us on our contact form of uh, things you want to see. But we have we have some storage design. We started this and then we kind of lost track. And then I said, hey, guys, let's get I got Seth. So many people ask about it. Let's do the video on it. But uh, definitely more to come on these topics because it's a there's a lot to talk about. Storage is um it's kind of black magic a little bit until you dive into it. And it's so yep. black magic. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, take care. All thanks right. a lot, Tom. Thanks for having us. Really happy to have come on. Come on. <laughs> come on.